there's so much power in looking at these numbers and looking at them consistently because they help tell a story. Business of Architecture, episode 389. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with Bolonle williams Oli, Chief Financial Officer and part owner of Mancini Duffy, a technology-first design firm based in New Jersey and New York City. Bolonle oversees the firm's financial and operational performance. Now, Bolonle has had 12 years working in the AEC industry, having worked with HLW and SOM prior to joining Mancini Duffy. She holds a master's in education and social policy from NYU, a master's in applied mathematics, and a bachelor's in mathematics from the City University of New York Hunter College, and is also a board member of the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation. In addition to her role at Mancini Duffy, she has founded several impact organizations in Nigeria that aim to improve education in low-income communities, empower women in the AEC industry, and at small design firms, as well as create awareness about NGOs across Nigeria. Balunle is launching her first book in November called Build Boldly, Chart Your Unique Career Path as a playbook for success in the architecture and design industry, offering business development tips, including lessons she's learned from being Mancini's CFO. In this episode, we discuss the role of CFO within an architecture practice and the importance of establishing a strong partnership between the accounts team and the project management team and the architecture team. We cover some key performance indicators or metrics they measure to ensure the success of their projects and how these metrics then filter into business development. We also talk about Belunle's philanthropic work and a bit of a peek into her new book, Build Boldly. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Belunle williams Oli. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Malanle, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I am great, thanks. Thank you so much for having me. My absolute pleasure. So you're, you are the, the CFO of Mancini Duffy. Um, you've had a really interesting career working specifically with architectural practices in their in their finance departments, essentially, you've got a, a, a background in finance and and and, and accounts. Um, how did how did your current position come to be, and how has it been working in the, in the architecture industry of all industries to be to find I'm yourself? I'm telling in? you, listen, it's um, I mean, first of all, again, thank you so much for having me, and um, how I ended up in the industry one and how I ended up in my role two is just like serendipitous. So we'll start current and then I'll tell you how I got into the industry. So um, about four and a half years ago, I got a phone call from an old colleague, my very first job, um, asking if I would be interested in possibly coming to run a finance organization, a finance group in an organization and he was being very secretive. He didn't want to tell me who, what, when. And I was like, you know what? Let me have this conversation. I'll take, I'll take the phone call. The person on the other line, when they called me, happened to be Christian Giordano, who's the president of Mancini Duffy. And I smiled because Christian and I had worked together um, at my very first company um, 10 years prior. Right. right. So not in the same department. Uh, he was director of architecture then. I was, you know, junior project accountant, just starting out, trying to figure out my way. But some way, somehow, I must have made an impression on one, that old colleague, to Christian, for them to now think 10 years after, let's approach her uh, to, to, to come work at Mancini or run, this, run the finance group. And so Christian and I went and had lunch. It was a really nice lunch. You know, then I was a senior part accountant. I had not um, had like these fancy 
interview lunches, right? Usually your interviews happen in an office and you're all like sweaty, but this was really relaxed. It was really relaxed. We went and we had a great conversation about uh, his vision for the company, um, the things that um, Mancini was looking to explore and, uh, you know, um, diversity of, of clients, you know, people that they worked with. And, and for me also, the things that they were doing with technology then, that it was real, real early then. And while he was having this conversation with me, um, I was like, I was so interested, but then I had a lot of questions for him. And I pretty much in this informal interview laid it all down for him. I said, listen, the work is good. We could do the work. But there are certain things uh, in terms of alignment that I'm looking uh, for in my next company, my next move. I need to make sure that there's value alignment between myself and Mancini, as well as him. And so I said, I have two little ones. <laughs> what is your firm's policy on, on, on flexibility? And, you know, what, it, what is your firm's policy on family? Like, how is that important to you? Uh, the next question I asked was, I was like, listen, I haven't seen things from a firm wide level when it comes to managing finances. How are you going to set me up for success? You know, so I, I asked um, pretty much, I would say it was pretty bold of me to ask the questions that I did at that mm -hmm. interview. Most times, you know, you're either trying to just show yourself, make sure that, you um, you know, you're presenting the best candidate, but I presented both sides. I presented my strengths and the value that I would bring to the organization. I, I spoke about the gaps that I had and how we're going to make sure that I was successful. And here we are now four and a half years later, flourishing and thriving in the company, right? So I joined as controller in 2017, mm -hmm. um, in 2018, I got promoted to CFO, and then in 2019, I became I became part owner, and joined um, Christian and our other partners in, in in leadership. So it's been an interesting and incredible ride so far. Amazing. And so yeah. before that, you were you were at SOM, correct? I was at SOM. Yes. Yes. And, and and how how do the two firms differ then from and, and particularly from the from like an accounts perspective and, and yeah. kind of culture wise? Yeah. It... So so SOM one was or is still you know one of the top four architectural firms I would say in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of count, SOM is probably SOM New York is probably triple the amount of, of staff uh, in, in, our, in the New York office only, right? So it was, it was huge. And one of the things that um, from a culture perspective, I'll say is you have to be very careful or intentional. I would use the word I would be, I would use as intentional, intentional about how you form relationships at SOM so you don't get lost in the numbers, right? And so for me, it was very, very important that I formed really strong relationships with my project managers, really strong relationship with the partners on the job, really strong relationship with my counterparts, accounting counterparts for the projects that I managed. And so I would say I created almost like a mini BOLA culture um, <laughs> at SOM. Whereas coming to Mancini, you know, Mancini one for me was, um, smaller size organization, even though we're working on really big and prestigious um, projects. But in terms of, of, you know, culture, it was a little bit different because here everyone is, is um, uh, fully engaged. Everyone is like, um, again, like I said, about family, you know, there, there was just a difference in flow where maybe things are a little bit more structured, which I, I, um, um, I'm appreciative of for my experience yeah. in SOM, right? The rigor <laughs> was there, right? In terms of how you would um, run an accounting close, for example. And so I was able to bring those experiences I had at SOM to um, Mancini, where maybe things were not as rigorous, but it, what to say, guys, listen, at least in my team, right? I could say, we need to start doing implementing these rhythms. We need to start um, being tighter with our closes. So that's the difference I would say in culture, but I was able to bring both, well, at least the experience from SOM as well as HLW to Mancini to build a really strong um, accounting team. Brilliant, brilliant. How would you, what would you describe the role of CFO within an architecture practice? What is it that, that, that you do? 
How, yes. would you, how would you describe that role? I mean, so for me, the, the, my one liner is, listen, I'm responsible for money. <laughs> That's my one liner, right? A chief financial officer. Yes, there's a lot that goes into it. But at the, at the, you know, at the end of the day, my primary responsibility is to make sure that my firm, um, one, is financially successful. Two, uh, we're also taking care of our people, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, the people who are working on the different projects, you need to make sure that, and uh, there's no issues when it comes to taking care of your salaries and all of that stuff. But overall, my, my role is to make sure that the firm succeeds from a financial perspective, be it you're implementing technology to help improve your processes, you're, you're putting in rhythms so that, um, you know, invoices are going out uh, at, at the, the proper time, right? You're, you're, you've not performed work and then billing your clients, what, two, three months after. Mm -hmm. um, and also for our project managers, right? So for me, I'm looking to empower project managers to understand the importance of their numbers when it comes to, to giving them foresight as to what is happening on their projects, right? And so what I mean by that is, how, how is your project performing today? What is the projections? Um, in terms of staffing and billing going forward, how can we have a full picture of where this, pro where this project is going to end or land based on what has happened so far, right? So you're, you are looking um, at earnings reports, you are looking at um, uh, project profitability, profitability reports, right? So there's an empowerment that happens right. and making sure that your project managers are consciously looking at those things, right? Looking at all those reports. Um, also, also for me, it's maintaining really strong relationships with, again, like I said, when I was a project accountant, I did that with my counterparts, but am I speaking to the right people on the client side when mm -hmm. it comes to making sure that they know um, our invoices are top of mind, right? So client relationships is very important to me, knowing who is the right person to speak to on that end making sure that I am supporting um, our project managers as best as possible when it comes to managing that side, right? Sometimes we are like the bad cops, <laughs> but me, I consider myself a, a, a reasonable cop, right? I'm only asking for what we are, what we are due. So there are various things. I, I mean, long and short to say, there are various aspects that, that rolls up into that statement, um, making sure your firm is financially successful. And so um, we could sit here and talk about like all of them, but I hope with the one or two examples I've given, that gives some insight into what I do. My day-to-day -day varies. So, so it's, it's really interesting actually then, um, who, who is it that produces all the reports for say project profitability? Is that the accounts yeah. team that does that? And then yes. these are things that the project architect uh, or project manager, they need to be kind of actively coming to you, or you publish them to the, you publish those reports to those to those guys, and then they need to distill the information. Yes, so I see us. Um, so, so my project accountants will produce these reports, right? So they're, they're Let's talk about one, maybe on a weekly basis. What are we What are we producing for the project managers? Well, for me and my teams, we're producing um, an accounts receivable report. Right. So you, you're a project manager, you have a bunch of projects you're managing and you have invoices that have gone out. Well, are we keeping track to make sure that these invoices are on schedule um, to, to be paid? And so one of the rhythms that I instituted when we came, when I, when I joined Mancini is for us to have a weekly project manager meeting where we're reviewing this, right? So it's a pulse check on our invoices because we know once you issue an invoice, you need it to turn into cash. So that is cash flow within your organization. And so um, we do that every week. We look at that every week. And then at the end of the month, part of our monthly process is one to issue um, time analysis reports, right? Who worked on your project? Um, and because that is now going to inform what you're building sometimes, right? So like you want to make sure that you're on track, making progress on, on um, the project, and then you're billing the appropriate amount or percentage complete, whatever the case may be. 
you want to make sure that you're billing um, what you've earned, right? Or billing based on schedule. And so the project accountants, again, work hand in hand with the project managers to make mm-hmm. sure that their invoicing is complete. Same thing with the earnings reports, right? So the project accountant, again, that role is so it's so special to me. And I think one, because I've, I did it for 10 years before now being sort of like, you know, leading people who are doing it. But that role is so critical to the success of projects, right? Because we are we are able to keep track and almost be like um, the project manager's um, eyes to help them catch blind spots that that they might not notice while they're in the thick of managing the project, right? So um, I always say that uh, we are um, we are a, a an integral member of the team, not a not someone that you only talk to once at the end of the month, but project managers should be working hand in hand with someone. If you have a project accountant working hand in hand with a project accountant or an accounts um, team member to make sure you're getting the information you need for your projects to be successful. So, so, so for me, so for me, I do like, you know, the month and I'm, all, I'm doing the firm wide view, right? right. But the, the project accountants are, are handling it. Um, based on their individual project managers that they're responsible for. Got it. Okay. So, so it's like the, the, the project accountant is, is an equivalent to the project architect in many ways. Yes, just on the number side. Just on the right? numbers so, side. Yes, yes. So, so, so how, how big is the financial team then at Mancini Duffy and, 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 the, and the current size of Mancini Duffy as a, as a whole office? Yeah, so we're actually a, a pretty tight lean team. I have two project accountants. Okay. I have um, an operations slash financial uh, manager that works, that, that is almost like my right hand in helping me with like the month and close mm-hmm. as well as um, office operations. And then um, I have an accounts payable person. So there are about four to five of us right now working in the um, accounting team. Mancini as a whole, we are uh, 70 strong probably now you know, recovering and, and hoping to grow after the, this, this past two years that we've all experienced. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, so I got it. So there's yourself and then two project accountants and those two project accountants, they are overseeing the kind of the granular details, if you like, of exactly. every single of project. What are some of the, of the, of the key performance indicators or, or, or metrics that you as the accounts team need to know from the architects to make sure that the project is running profit- profitably? Yeah, so um, one of the things, you know, I, I think I mentioned about the project profitability report. One of the yeah. things that we typically need, right, um, from PMs when, let's use, a, let's use an example. So October is a, we're recording this in October. October is about to come to an end. Yeah. And when you when when you look at your project, you have um, job to date activity that has happened, right? So there's been staff that has worked on it. So there are hours which equate to you know dollars spent on the project, and then there's also um, revenue that you've earned, right? So at a at the end of October, we have how the project has performed. A key metric that we need from the project managers to be able to see what that full project view is going to look like is staffing going forward, right? How do I paint a full picture if I don't, if I don't, um, if I can't estimate as best as I can where we're going forward? And so one of the things we ask them for is, you know, staffing projections going forward, as well as billing projections going forward, right? Because then I'm now able to take what we've done today and then pair it with what we think we're going to do or what we need to do to complete the project. And then that gives me a full um, view of where the project will land at any point in time. And what I mean by that is at month end, that gives me a full view of where the project is going to land. So those two information they're very critical in terms of us understanding how the project is progressing. And one for the project manager, if what they initially thought when they did their, you know, projections, are they on track? Yeah. How can we tell if you're, if you're on track, if we're not measuring those, um, measuring how you're progressing? So that's, that's one example. Another um, 
you know, I, I think I also mentioned this earlier, another key <laughs> that another key indicator that's really, really important to me is understanding where our accounts receivables stand, right? So that's where I have these meetings with the PMs to know what is coming in because that that tells me how um, we are going to be performing from a cash perspective. Right. If I'm not paying attention or I'm just walking blind, not knowing, you know, if one, there's a problem with, with invoices being paid or if it's quote unquote lost, uh, you know, in email or if the client has an issue, right? If we're not following up with that, then I'm not able to do a cash flow projection, right? And so I need the PMs to one, um, be, uh, you know, speaking to their to speaking to their clients so that they can resolve any issues mm -hmm. um, that that could possibly be surrounding invoice coming in, and then that allows me build a strong cash flow projection based on the information that they know at this point in time. As we know on projects, we can go to next week and and everything is out the door. Yes. Got it. Okay. So, so it's actually the project management managers. They're the one, if there is a problem with the client, for example, being late with an invoice, would it be the accounts team or would it be the project managers that's actually dealing with that relationship or so, both? So for me, it's, it's, it's both. I see it as both people, right? It's almost like a double touch point, right? Because the project manager just speaking with their, their own counterpart, whoever is managing the accounts on, on the other side, one, you can, form a relationship well they're already speaking to them all the time yeah. so they they um already know if the project manager has passed the invoice down to accounting the reason why that accountant to accountant um relationship is critical is because like we said the project managers can say yes it's approved but it still has to go to accounting to get paid right right so your accountant should be should be trying to form a relationship with the, uh, their own um, uh, accounting counterpart on the client side, because then they will be able to tell you, yes, we've received it. There truly is no issues. It went through our system well, uh, and we will be paying you on X date. Got right? it. Yeah. So that's why I think it's not, you know, of course, um, there are relationships where sometimes it's the PM has to manage that relationship and no one else can really get involved, mm -hmm. but it's understanding how can, if the project accountant can help take some of that off your plate, right. Yeah. And make sure that they're the ones doing the follow-up, um, with the clients, then great, you know, makes great, it easier. but <laughs> it makes it easier. But the one thing is we're all speaking, you can't communicate <laughs> you know, there's, there's never not enough communication when it comes to things like this, right? Because mm -hmm. things just slip. We get busy. Everyone gets busy, but I always say people pay people. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so what happens when, say, for example, a client is late with an invoice? What's the sort of mechanism? Is that something where you have to get involved and you start yes. talking to the client? And yeah. Talk? So it depends on how, one, it depends on how late, two, it depends on why they're late, right? Yep. So like we said, are they late because we didn't do something on mm -hmm. the project that's making the client hold up? Or are they late because it was missed, right? Um, they, they didn't see it in their email or, or are they late because we didn't meet the cutoff when it comes to submitting invoices, right? So there might be a myriad of reasons why the client is late or are they late because they're just late. <laughs> but by the time you establish this, I call it a standard, right? Like, you know, now I'm very sure some of our clients know to expect a Mancini project manager or project accountant to be reaching out to them, right? Yeah. So if doing that just puts you top of mind on the clients, um, you know, when the client is reviewing their, their own payables, right? So for me, it depends on how late before I get involved. It could be year end and I'm getting involved way before year end, <laughs> speaking to my own, as we know, right? Year end, we're trying to make sure that we're closing out um, outstanding invoices that we're getting in, in the cash that we need to make sure that we meet all our um, expectations for the year. So that's when I might get involved. But if it's really, if it's really bad, I try to not let it get really bad, right? That's the whole point of establishing all these rhythms beforehand so that we are minimizing the bad cases. 
Right. And then there's just sometimes where, I mean, you just can't get anyone. So, you know, that's where you now have to like have serious conversations about deciding what is bad debt, right? Like what is a write-off? Like is, is the project dead? Is it, you know, there's just so many things that mm-hmm. can come up. But if accounting isn't speaking with project managers, you will not know. Got it. Got it. You won't know. We need to get down. So my whole thing is getting down to the root of why we are late. <laughs> Brilliant. So in an architectural practice, obviously the industry is kind of notorious for having these feast or famine cycles. The industry as a whole is very sensitive to, you know, current trends and economics Mm -hmm. and any sorts of, you know, financial disruptions that are happening, you know, elsewhere in the economy, construction builds it very quickly. So yes. what sorts of strategies have you learned over your you know, career, both at SOM at Mancini, Duffy and HLW, to yeah. the, the architect practices are using to, to weather, number one, economic sco- storms, and, and two, to be able to kind of flatten out the feast and famine cy- cycle as much as possible? Yes, yes. So I, I, I find this, um, for me, it's interesting because now I've now lived through two uh, major, right, global um, economic crisis. Well, one, the first one, of course, being the 2008 financial crisis, where I was more so, you know, an employee. I was just on the team, making mm-hmm. sure that we we got through that period. And then now, leading, um, you know, through, of course, COVID-19 and the, the pandemic, and now having to lead an organization, right? So I've had two experiences, two different sorts of pressures. But one of the things, um, or, or there, there's several things that I did at the start of the pandemic very early on um, to make sure that um, we could weather, like you, you know, like you said, weather through this period now, whether it has la- worked the past for now two years, right? At the start of the pandemic, we all thought it was going to be a short while. So of course you've had to really be innovative and, yeah. and um, be flexible with, with strategies that you put in place. But at the start of the pandemic, one one of the things that really helped us out a lot um, was the rhythms we already had in place, right? So because we had strong um, relationships when it came to collecting on our receivables and making sure our receivables were coming in on time, from a cash flow perspective at the start of the pandemic, we, you know, we had, um, would I say, it didn't particularly, we didn't particularly feel the effects right at the start because we had already been following up on all those old invoices um, up through to March, right? So where I say we plus maybe other organizations started really feeling it real tight, probably like in June, right? When you saw that revenue dip, Mm-hmm. Um, like you mentioned, when projects went on hold, um, where where everyone was like, I, you know, nobody knew what was yeah. going on, right? So a lot of organizations saw real sharp declines. And so I had to figure out how I was going to maximize my cash flow management those the entire period. So one, reaching out to our vendors, you know, our payables vendors to see how I could negotiate um, um, payment term extensions, right? right? And the reason why I could reach out to them, one, was because I paid my bills on time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? I had a flow, right? So um, reaching out to some of these uh, vendors helped uh, helped either one, increase the window, helped me manage cash flow a little bit better, right? Um, on the client side, you know, making sure that the clients that we needed to collect on or the clients I formed relationships with, I spoke with them to make sure that we were still good for payments, at least on the invoices that we had open. Mm-hmm. Um, so just from a cash flow manager perspective, those are two very, very important things, right? Because it's who owes you, who do you owe? Yeah. And that's going to determine how much cash you have left, right? At the, for the past two years, it's, all, it's solely been about cash, right? We were in survival mode. And then once we pass the Bible mode, it's now, how can we look at our pipeline? What projects do we have coming in to help um, backfill the revenue that we've lost and how quickly can we recover? 
what areas are we looking at in which we can now leverage whatever skill or strength, right? Maybe outside of our core um, core areas that can help uh, generate revenue or that we can begin to put these plans in place so that once things pick up globally, we can take off. So a, a great example would be, you know, Mancini's um, design lab and like thinking about how um, we did our 3D and virtual reality. Um, well, it's called a 3D, um, uh, 360 design process, right? And so our 360 design process in the past was in person or we had to take the laptops. We had a, a design session on the go. Well, what they ended up doing in the lab was think about how can we, how can we um, create a model that will allow people to do it online, mm-hmm. right? So think about that. That's, once we did that, that, that essentially has now created, from crisis, created a, a possible revenue stream once things picked up. Right. So those are some of the some of the ways that Mancini in which we approached managing or weathering through through the storm. And for me now, it's, of course, documenting, too. Right. Because we might not have one on the scale of a pandemic, but situations happen uh, it regularly. Right. You yeah. can have a your really large project go on hold. And how do you now manage? It's, of course, looking at that manual or that playbook that got you through the worst of the worst times and um, watching out for the indicators on there so that you can now like activate the right lever or, you know, or pull the right triggers um, um, to make sure that you get through the difficult, uh, th- that difficult period. In in general, does Mancini Duffy... Um... Are you are you billing through project milestones or are you billing monthly? Do you have a billing strategy to make sure that you're able to keep things moving? Yeah, so so it's it's mixed, right? It, it depends on um, the clients you're working with, but we do bill monthly. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing, right? PM project managers are always looking at um, uh, their pool of projects and making sure that uh, the invoices that can be billed, majority of them we bill monthly. I mean, we do have certain clients that might want you to bill on a milestone. Um, but for us to make sure that, you know, cash flow, right, is, is consistent, you have to make sure that you are billing your projects um, at least every month, right? Yeah. So that it's a spread. And then you don't have months where you haven't built anything and then you then build then you have to wait three months before the invoices come in as we know like that's our cycle right we we invoice sometimes you get clients who are great and pay you right on time Mm -hmm. with what you have written in your proposal but then like we mentioned there are things that happen on projects that could slow that down and we want to make sure we're minimizing that slow down what, what what are some of the things that slow down a project in terms of your billing cycle from your own perspective? I mean, from from the Mancini Duffy side. Yeah, I'm sure, that, I'm sure um, it doesn't happen often. But no, well, I, I mean, <laughs> again, it's projects, right? So you could have additional services. One, let, let's say you're working on a project. This is a, a perfect example. And additional services not yet approved, right? But but there's time being worked on it. So that could be something that would slow down that time being captured mm. in in um, in an invoice cycle, right? So then it, it so of course one of the things I'm always looking at is our work in progress report, which is work that you've performed but you have not built yet, and understanding why we haven't built it yet. Got it. Okay. And Again, so, so right. So how so how do you deal with things like scope creep? Then is that is that Oof. something is that Oof. something else that happens? <laughs> yes, you know that my my perfect world would be I don't know if you've heard of the triangle. You've seen the triangle, right? So time resource, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cost. That is my, my perfect world would be where where that triangle is just staying <laughs> balanced. But we know that that the, the perfect equilateral triangle, right? And so for scope scope creep, of course, one is. Um, with the project managers understanding, well, one, are we building, are we making sure that we're not leaving things on the table that should be built? Mm. If your pro- if your proposal said uh, I'm going to do three test fits and you're now you have to do a fourth one, 
what are the mechanics in place to make sure that um, you've alerted the client that you will be sending an ASR or, or is scope creep coming up because we didn't, we underestimated how much time truly it would take us to do, you know, the tasks, right? So I always think it's going back to understanding what the root of it is and quickly um, one, either catching it beforehand <laughs> If you're looking at your if you're looking at your time analysis reports, you will the indicators are there. Right. You will see if you have planned somebody uh, to work twenty hours on a, on a project, and next thing they're you know their timesheets come in the vein of all architectural firm existence is timesheets, right? You will <laughs> see if someone is working forty hours one week. Okay, maybe you know maybe what happened. Mm -hmm. two weeks what's happening right we don't want to wait till the end of the month and see oh we projected someone 20 hours and they worked 80 but we don't know why is it scope creep you know what is causing it and if it if it truly is like additional services making sure that we are communicating to the client so that we can get a bill how cause this is again really interesting around timesheets and that is obviously one of the the most complex oh. things in any practice is in theory it's always you know everything everything always at some point comes back down to measuring time it, it, it all comes and, down to that because that's the basis of i mean all in our industry that's the basis of how we we you know do projects yeah it's you're spending time that's going to be that's going to convert to dollars Yes. And so it's, I'm always thinking about like interesting ways in which to remind our staff the importance of getting their timesheets done on time. I do think, I, I do think that if um, people want, if the basic, you know, or, or entry level architect that starts, if we do spend just a little bit more time explaining to them the importance, not even from a dollar's perspective, but from um, how does this time that I'm working roll up into the larger project? There might mm -hmm. be a different approach in terms of mindset to getting that time sheet done. Yeah, how, that's so, like because it's interesting as well. Because I know I know one of the things when I spoke to Christian last time about the the transparency that um, Anthony yeah. Duffy has with their with, with you know between the leadership and the rest of the team in being quite open about. Um, you know, the stats and facts of what's happening yes. financially in the business. And often when there isn't that level of transparency, a timesheet for an employee can just feel like, ah, oh, this is just like, it's the boss looking over my shoulder. Yes. Um, yes. How, how, yeah. How, how does that culture of being open and transparent with the finances kind of, you know, enroll people into the business aspects of it and, yeah. and doing things like timesheets, if you like? Yeah, for me, it's it's buy-in, right? Mm. Like the transparency causes buy-in. It's a mindset shift. It's 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 understanding that it's not meant to be like um, one either spanking you for spending too much time, but yeah. truly like um, being transparent will help you get more. I'm not saying you're gonna have a hundred percent, right? There mm -hmm. there will be time um, where where project takes precedence over, you know, a project deadline is going to take precedence over doing your timesheets on a Friday, <laughs> right? But I think um, being transparent, one, explaining not once, but multiple times, right? It's a habit. Explaining not once, but multiple times why it's important um, helps you minimize the amount of late timesheets. <laughs> <laughs> also you minimize the amount of late time sheets you have, right? So if people don't understand why it's important or why they are doing this task, it's always going to seem like a chore. That's the same thing with following up with, I mean, I'm, I'm diverging a little bit, but again, it's understanding the why. Why are we following up on our invoices? Yes. Why, you know, like, why do we need to do timesheets? It's, there's nothing, my, my philosophy when it comes to finances or explaining numbers is to keep it so simple. Mm -hmm. If you keep it simple and um, in language, 
that your person who's receiving it understands, right? So architects didn't go to school to study numbers, right? Or, or to do finances. But if you're able to um, communicate in clear language and keep it uh, simple, then you will have more buy-in. Got it. Does that okay. mean that we never have a late time shift? No, it, it's <laughs> not, it, not in, in all my experiences in every single firm. There's always like, this is the vein of accountants existence. There's always a late time sheet. We, we think about ways in which, okay, should we lock the computer? Should we, <laughs> should we, uh, I love what we did. I don't know if they still do it at HLW, but when I was there, we had a computer um, in accounting and you had to come back. Like if you were late, you had to walk to accounting to do your timesheet there. <laughs> And so you're probably thinking, I don't want to have to make that walk back there. That's like the walk of shame. Let me just do my time sheets on time. And um, interestingly, you know, even with our accounting software, right? There's an app. You can do it on the web. You don't need to get into the, the system. We use Dell Tech Vision. You don't have to get into the system like to do your time sheets, but some way, somehow. <laughs> We still well, have late time well, sheets. You could just you could just say you well we, we can't we can't pay you until your time sheets are done. <laughs> I, you know, but I don't I don't want to be arrested. <laughs> I don't want the HR cops to come and arrest me and say you're withholding pay, right? I think that would <laughs> that would make everyone really happy, but unfortunately we cannot legally do that. So that's no, why we have to come I, up with like I, I, HR rules around ways. doing that. Yes, you have to go with creative ways to make sure that. Uh, I, I, I seem to remember working in a place where they had a raffle once a week. And if you didn't finish, your, if your timesheets hadn't been done, then you couldn't be entered into the raffle. So <laughs> maybe I'm going to, I'll try that. I'll try that. We, we have periods, right? We have yeah. periods. And, and I think most firms will say this. They have periods where it's on the money, right? Everyone is doing it. And then you have periods where it's just really tough, right? Maybe because multiple projects are having deadlines and people just can't get to it. I just want you to communicate. Don't just ghost me. <laughs> yeah. Communicate and, and really like reach out to us to see how we can help you, right? I don't... It, you, I find that PMs or people on the floor, you're working on so many projects. How do you even remember what you did? Like, I don't remember what, what did I have for breakfast yesterday? I, so if you're waiting like one week, two weeks, um, and you're not doing your time sheets, oh my goodness, you know, like, I, I, how do you know what you worked on? Mm -hmm. Again, like I said, the why is important. Why are you doing your time sheets? You're doing your time sheets one so that we can understand what, well, one, what you've done. Two, what is happening on the project. Three, once we have a view of what's happening on the project, is it according to what we thought? And if it's not according to what we thought, how can we course correct? <laughs> how can we course correct? I can't course correct early enough if I don't see the time that has been put on the project. Mm. I don't want to wait till the end of the month to fix something that I could have helped you with two weeks prior. Yeah. Are, 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 there, yeah. are there ways then that you as the, in the accounts team, once, once people have submitted their timesheets, that then you've got to go through a process of kind of gauging how accurate they are. Because yeah. obviously from, you know, in, in a, in a, if you're in a project team and you're kind of like, you know, you just fill out your timesheets and yes. you know, you're like, you know, eight hours a day, yeah, full, full working, but you know, in reality that somebody's not doing a full eight hours of work every single day, because they're going to be doing other things. They're going to be, you know, there, there'll be times between projects or all that sort of yes. sort of stuff. So how, how do you kind of gauge that uh, accuracy? Yeah. So I mean, yeah, we, we gauge it. Um, so I, I, I've mentioned, I think, earlier on this time analysis report, which essentially is a report that looks at what hours are being charged to billable projects, mm -hmm. what hours are being charged to non-billable projects. And what we do is we um, send out these reports. Like once we've posted a timesheet, we send out this report to one on a weekly basis to the project manager. 
um, or the studio who has the, the set of people that are working on there so that they can take a look and see where their people are working. Yeah. And again, weekly, good. At least that gives you a pulse. But for me, I can then look at it on a monthly um, base to see what was this person's um, targeted uh, uh, utilization rate, right? Yes. So entry-level architect, maybe your utilization rate is 90%. 90% of your time should have been worked on billable projects. What the time analysis report is going to help me see is, okay, where did you really come in, right? Did you come in at 80%? Well, if you came in at 80% and you really were supposed to be at 90%, then what, where is that 20% going? Did you incorrectly fill out your timesheets? Did you, were you working on a marketing proposal, right? Mm. So that's why I say that there's so much power in looking at these numbers and looking at them consistently because they help tell yes. a story. They help tell a story. And so for me, um, that helps me ask the project manager, hey, what's going on? And then we we go into the you know the quantitative plus the qualitative help paint the the true picture of what happened in the course of the month mm -hmm. or if they're working if they were supposed to have been working ninety but one to three months they're coming in at a hundred percent well is the person overworked are we booking them on too many projects what is happening how can we rebalance the team to make sure that you know um, the teammates are not getting burnt out. So you've got the, the analysis of the timesheets. How does this then start to filter into when you're doing fee proposals and the, and the business development side? Yes, yes. So, I mean, so there are several ways in which it can filter in. One, let's say we're currently working on a project um, and you're almost done. Let me give mm -hmm. that example. Let's say you're almost done and you're now about to bid for a new project. Well, if you look at your current existing projects, take the one I just said, um, it's similar in scope, uh, maybe um, similar in uh, similar uh, industry, right? Yeah. It gives you a basis of how to then um, form or create a, a new fee projection for this project that you're trying to go after. Right. So that's where that's a, a simple example of where making sure your timesheets are in, seeing, making sure that people are accurately charging. It kind of helps you inform um, how to go after other projects, uh, maybe within the same within the same scope or realm, especially if you did really well. Right. How do mm -hmm. you know what projects <laughs> are either maybe a studio's strong, strong sets or strong suits if yep. you're not looking at how they perform. Or maybe we like really, really sucked on one project, right? We, we set a free proposal at the start. We've never done anything like it. We had come in maybe um, way, we had blown our budget. When you're going after a new proposal, then that helps you like reconfigure, right? So there's a sort of lessons learned or like how can we improve um, when we're going after the next, the next, the next project. So that's why for me, it's always important that we're tracking these things accurately. Got it. So, so do you work then quite closely with the, the business development team or the partners that are going after new work or are you actively involved in yourself in actually setting fees? And no, so, so I don't set the fees with them, but we make sure that um, they're getting the accounting support, right? Billing right. rates, um, whatever um, project uh, detail report that they need if, if they want to compare scope. We make sure that we are providing that support mm -hmm. when it comes to them setting the fees. The other thing we know is that we might set fees, but then what is the market, <laughs> what is the market calling for? I think, you know, we were just having this conversation where, um, you know, like the cost to pro the cost to do a project has drastically increased. I mean, from talents, right? The talent that's working on it, uh, materials, whatever the case may be, the cost to do that has drastically increased, but the square footage <laughs> per cost has not really changed that much. And so you know, like, how do you then make sure that you're making yourself, um, you're not, 
out pricing yourself from certain projects, right? So like yep. how how I don't want to use the word low, but like when you set your fee, like how do you make sure that you're communicating value so that you're being paid for what you're saying you're producing? even though the market might be calling for a different thing, you have to be very, very strategic to know when, yeah. when to go, when to push for that or when not to. Yeah. And it, like the market part is just some of that is out of our control. Yeah. And I, I suppose that the, the, the question is how do you prevent your services becoming commoditized? Yes. And that yeah. you're able to still remain as a, as a premium service and be able to communicate that to, you know, in a, inside of a very competitive market where there could, you, there could be now, other architects who could just be undercutting what it is that you're going to do, but yes. they're, they're not doing the same service. Not doing the same service. So it's, I mean, that's where, you know, at least for, for the team that's going in, either presenting to the client where they really have to be strong in communicating this value. Like what makes men seem different? Why you should go with us? How are we working? Are we approaching the right clients who will understand that value too, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you, you have to know um, who, you know, which clients or who you're speaking to, the core clients that you should be speaking to that will appreciate that. And then more of them will, will lean on. And I say this, you know, it was, it was interesting for us, or, or would I call it a challenge? Not a challenge. When we started this whole 360 design process, right, convincing our clients that this is now not going to cost way more, but that we're bringing our top-notch way of work to them and convincing them to, to buy into our process, right? But it started with one person, <clears throat> one client seeing the benefits of doing this 360 design process, seeing how much money it will save them, when it, when it comes to, you know, actually um, building out the project, right? Catching a lot of these things up front. And then one client became two, became 10, right? And then now we're just saying, this is how we work. Yeah. Right? So you, you, you have to, it, to really want to believe in what, <laughs> believe in what you are providing. Uh, and then, of course, thinking about who are the clients that are going to, uh, to bet on you and allow you to really prove yourself and of course pay you <laughs> pay you for that and then and then you begin to build a uh, proof right one might be a mistake two okay fine but three okay you're telling a really <laughs> a really good <laughs> a really good um there's something there yes yeah, yeah. Interest, very fascinating. So fascinating. Um going back to that that what I was saying asking about in terms of the entrepreneurship at Mancini Duffy um, and I know that you've, you know, the, the, the transparency with the numbers and the business plan and the vision uh, of the company and how well it's communicated at Mancini Duffy um, has led to, you know, employees and team members actually kind of creating their own departments yes. within the, in the office. Yes. How, how does yeah. that work from your perspective in the, in the finance world? Is it oh. something that you're, you're super welcoming and love it when people are doing this? And, and then you have to, and then if, you know, I, I know like it was an interiors department that Mancini Duffy that kind of recently took on. Was that right? Uh, um, I think you're referring to MDLX, right? Our, right. The decorate. Yes, yes. So I absolutely welcome it. Myself, you know, our other partners, we absolutely welcome it. And for my personal perspective let me let me start then and then we'll go into it from, yeah. from a personal perspective we spend a lot of time together <laughs> working <laughs> together people have um interests and interests that you know i think if if they're supported or if they're allowed to express whether it's in the office out of the office but if they feel feel that you know the firms or the, the firm that they're working in um, actually shows interest or cares about their own interest, you're going to find an employee who is more engaged, right? Yeah. Like my company actually likes the fact that I, I'm using me as an example, I crochet hats to, to, to donate to a NICU, right? Those were some of the things that Christian was, at that interview that I mentioned earlier was like curious about, or I have a nonprofit and I'm, and I'm, um, 
uh, doing projects in Nigeria, my home country. I'm really passionate about education. And he was so excited to learn more. I was instantly sold, right? And yeah. so like, that is the environment that we are creating now for, for our um, teammates or employees, right? Like, what idea do you have? How can we support it in whatever capacity, you know, maybe you're doing it once a month, once a quarter, like how can we support you? And what are the things that you would like to see happen within the organization? So you had mentioned um, uh, MDLX, right? So uh, one, two of our employees had come to Christian then to, to bring this idea and they laid out a business plan. <laughs> they laid out a structure, right? They had done their homework. And so, of course, myself now working closely with them to say, okay, how much we look at our overall budget to see how much of it can, is it, is it viable? Are we able to support them financially, not just um, uh, by mouth, right? Like, are we able to create, create a line here for them to, mm -hmm. to run off with? And they did. They went out, they got, they've got. Um, clients in, they were able to lean into our client pool. It also made sense um, because it was already like an extension of what we do. Yeah. So our clients were, it wasn't hard to convince them to, to um, hire MDLX, right? Yeah. So, but imagine if they came and we shut that, that idea down. Yeah. You know, you're going to have a demotivated em employee. Maybe, maybe not. But yeah. I, more, me, more, the, more likely and more likely they would take that idea somewhere else. They take it somewhere else or they do it themselves or yeah. whatever the case may be. But I do find from experience, not just for me, not just for the employees who want to do this, right? Um, even friends, right? In their own organizations, it's a trend, right? The, the unique things about us when our bosses or whoever, or if you're the boss, if you key into that, you're going to get a more engaged employee. You're going to get someone who one will either stay with you longer mm. to will do really good work, right? Because they have an outlet. Work is not always rosy every time, right? But if their outlet is appreciated, you will find that they're more committed to performing at their job. This is just my observation. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's research out there, but uh, maybe someone needs to research it. But I, I truly do believe that. And so that's why we encourage entrepreneurship. That's why we encourage, you know, diversity of ideas. Um, you know, we, a, a more recent example, two of our studio leaders have taken on talent, mm -hmm. the talent team. And they've done a much better job than, you know, those of us, Christian is out trying to win work. I'm here trying to make sure the <laughs> firm makes it out of a pandemic. I am grateful that these people have strong skills and are, are you now finding out these skills that might have been dormant within you. You're finding that you're actually really good at sourcing, to, you know, like identifying good talent nurturing good talent i mean what more can you ask you know for for someone to find fulfillment right so it's a way that they're also finding um personal fulfillment so so so, so the talent team they're like a, a group of team members already and they're going out and they're helping find yes, talent with, yes so we had two of them that's they're amazing now, you know <laughs> they they were not and, and interestingly they were not um they recently um one is a principal right he he also he's just like an entrepreneur so he also wanted to explore um the aviation practice mm -hmm. he went and and got like found a client got a relationship and before you know it one step led, led to another and there's like a full-blown aviation practice Mancini wow. never had an aviation practice before this. What if we told him no? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so of course, financially now, the fi you know, we talked about the financial side from MDLX, but it, on that aviation practice, he's now created, again, a revenue stream for the organization. And what that does is it also creates a stream for him. Yeah. Right. We're taking care. We want the firm to be successful, but we want the firm to be successful so that we can take care of everyone. Yes. Yeah. And maintain, maintain the talent as well. Yeah. How do we nurture them? How do you retain good people if you don't 
care and take care of them too from a money perspective. <laughs> Amazing. Brilliant. I know we're, we're, we're fast coming to the, the end here. Just before um, we conclude, I'd love to talk a little bit about some of your philanthropic work and, yes. and also Build Boldly. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, my, my nonprofit is called She Builds Lives. Mm-hmm. It's going on almost nine years. Um, it started off with me. I, I spoke, said a word or two about this, but it started off with me actually crocheting um, hats that I was giving out to NICUs, um, you know, like shelters here during the holidays. And a, a burden I've always had or, or something that I was always curious about solving, helping in, in, or impacting in any way was education in Nigeria, right? So I went to, I grew up in Nigeria, um, moved to the States at age 17, but I've always been um, passionate about how can I help improve education for children mm-hmm. in low-income communities? Yeah. My whole thing is like, let's let, again, I, I'm sure I've used the word care a lot. So you guys, you know that I care, but like how do children in these communities feel that the people who quote unquote made it or have privilege are coming back to show them that they care about their future, mm. right? The investment is in is in the next generation. How does a country get out of whatever state it's in, poverty wise? It's by providing resources, um, educational, whether formal, whether um, not, right? Because all sorts of people can come out of. You could be an artist. You could be whatever. But how are we providing the resources and access they need? to learn. And so um, She Builds Lives quickly evolved over the years. I still love to crochet. My, my yarns are upstairs, but <laughs> has evolved to like, how can I provide resources in, for different um, communities all across Nigeria? And I'm really proud in 2019, we completed our first school rebuild project in um, Makoko, which is a community, a, a floating community in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, that houses 200 and right. Well, currently we have 206 children. So it's like my adopted school, right? So I've supported them over the last uh, five years and then they needed a new space for learning. But what this space has now done, um, we've built this structure, but we've now made it multi-purpose, right? So during the day, the children are there for nursery and primary school. Um, so elementary for the U S listeners, um, but um, in the summertime, we have summer camp. We have um, summer uh, after lesson, uh, lesson programs for graduates of the primary school who are trying to get to college. I was um, fortunate enough, I was in Nigeria in August, and I was fortunate enough to actually visit the school for the first time since I've supported them oh, wow. in five years. And oh my goodness, I, I was just completely blown away. There is, you know, you can support what actually seeing them and seeing the impact you're making in the community. Um, they had the current students there. They had alumni who were getting ready to go to university. These are children who might never have had that opportunity if they didn't have a school to go to, if they didn't have an elementary school to go to. So you actually get to see, you know, education is a long-term impact, a long-term investment. You're not going to see the results today. But to see those children who are saying, you know, um, I, I, I went to the great Wainina and because of what you did five years ago, you know, I am now able to apply for university. And I and because we see you, that's they're talking to me now. Yeah. Um, this is one of the girls that shared. She was like, I have a role model. Like I can see what is possible for me. Mm. And people like that, you know, they might not. There, there's so many cases like that all yeah. across, right? So I'm just doing my own little drop in the big ocean um, to to make to push the needle forward. Okay. So yeah, so that's the work I do through through She Builds Lives, um, and it's it's extremely rewarding, extremely rewarding. Amazing, and and yeah. the, and the book Build Boldly. Yes. So how, how, how did this come about? Bill Bowley is a book that I have been running away from for like multiple years until this January this year. 
Um, I had a, a very, uh, you know, actually I shared this, I had a very critical conversation with, um, with, with someone at the publishing company that I worked with. And at the end of the conversation, she said, it, it would be, I, I don't mean to put pressure on you, but you need to share through your story and your career journey um, so that other people can crack their own playbook. So essentially, nobody gave me a playbook. Nobody told me what to do. I have figured my way out in the last 14 years. Yeah. But when I reflected back and looked at pivotal growth moments in my career or where I grew exponentially, it truly was me leaning into the bold side, bold, courageous side of me, right? It, there were bold, courageous actions by me staying curious, by me forming relationships. I think maybe those are themes that you would have seen from our conversation by, you know, by, by pressing into, into this side of me, that's when I saw growth. And so um, Build Boldly really is to ignite in people and leaders, um, you know, that bold, courageous side of them when it mm -hmm. comes to crafting their own career playbooks for success, right? So looking at the themes that uh, um, over my 14 years uh, career, how can you then, as you, you are reading, how can you then take some of these things and apply to yourself to craft your own unique right career playbook i think that's that's the thing that's very important to me everybody's path is unique but you have to want to do it right so yeah. it, you, there, there's intentionality that comes from it so i i say it's for people who are looking to intentionally change their paths and for leaders who are looking to intentionally change the path for others right you you want to not just do things status quo but you actually want to lead your people boldly and so, you know, I'm hoping that uh, it will do what it, the book will do what it's written for and sent out to do Amazing. When, when it gets into readers' hands. Brilliant, brilliant. I've got, I've got a digital copy here, which I've, I've, been, I've been looking through. And I, re I really love, you know, the, the definition of bold or the, the yes. bold, bold as an anagram, be yourself, open your mind, um, lift others and don't wait, do it now. And that was... Yes. Absolutely fantastic. Yes, I love that. Yeah, so, so that's the bold framework, right? So I looked at what are these four things that, um, that have always been up inside Bolanli and um, how could I put it into words? And the word, you know, and that's how I came up with bold, right? Be yourself is so, is so key. That's, that's who, all you can be, you know, and more people need to have um, the agency to do that, right? Like we, when I, early on in my career, when I was trying to fit into a box or when I wasn't really leaning into this mathematics degree that I had, I wasn't getting the right opportunity. Mm. But the moment, like that, that, when I say pivotal, right? Like the moment I had that HLW interview and I like spoke about my math degree, I spoke about this complex um, thesis I was writing on. It stood me out from the path. And the guy interviewing me also studied math. How amazing is that, right? So th that's, that's where you really find the sauce. I call it the sauce, right? Like what, is, what, is, what are our individual special sauces? And do you, are you able to identify somebody who is not there yet, but you can get them there? Yeah. What I mean by like in terms of potential, right? So you wanted to be able to take either an A player to an A plus player, right? That the work, they'll figure it out. <laughs> they'll figure it out. But like, what are the other things that makes this person unique that that will differentiate them when it comes to their work ethic or their characteristics or how they show up? Those are the things that you should look out for. Amazing. Love it. I love it. Yeah. Bolan Lee, thank you so much. That's the perfect place to conclude. I've got still got loads more questions I'd love to ask you and talk to you. Everything from about yeah. your, your mathematics thesis to going deeper <laughs> into, into leadership. So we'll, we'll have to speak again, I think. And yes. I, I've really this enjoyed it. This was such a great conversation. Thank, um, I thank thoroughly you. enjoyed myself.
Excellent. Good. No, likewise. And you, you, thank you so much for, for you just sharing your expertise and going into real detail there about, about your role, your career, and how Mancini Duffy operates from the financial perspective. Definitely. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Very right, good. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.